human can develop a sixth sense uh, in just a blink of an eye. Be making a step change to the next level. My brain goes into my legs, and my brain goes into my whole body. For the last few decades, we've been gaining about three months of lifespan per year. It's still sort of an optimization. Everyone optimizes. Since humans exist, they augmented themselves. We might not even yet fully be able to imagine all the positive new things. It's what makes us humans special, that we are, uh, we are capable of developing ourselves and simply enhancing our lives in a very radical manner. I have the feeling to use my whole body again, and that's very beautiful for someone who is paraplegic. I worked as a trapeze artist and contortionist until all the year 2007, where I had an accident, I fall off the trapeze. I had never seen an exoskeleton before. At the first day, I thought it would be really easy to do everything I could do with my able body as I did before the accident. The exoskeleton, it has to be an interaction with, uh, with, with uh, engineers and the user. My brain became part of the machine when the machine was part of me and I could use it as if it was my amplified body. Now the time has come when augmentation is not happening outside of the body anymore, but in it. World more implants are passive NFC transponders that can be safely put in your body and they just work as standard payment devices. So you can pay contactlessly simply with using your hand or any other place of your body where you decided where you decide to get your implant in. Of course you need a certain degree of control about that, but the security and also the privacy implementations into these technologies are an important aspect. So having an implant, uh, it's just an additional piece or additional form of payment. Of course, because it's in our body and they're running 24-7, the topic of privacy is even more important. Uh, you have two extremes. First one is, let's change the world basically. And the second extreme is like, what the hell are you talking about? Hello everybody, welcome to the Kaspersky Meet the Augmented debate. Human augmentation is a fascinating emerging field of study, whether for health reasons such as using a bionic limb or out of choice such as inserting a chip so that they can open their front door without a key. Human augmentation is an area that has medical, ethical and social and legal implications. Kaspersky has just released the findings of some research into how people feel about augmentation in the UK, Austria, France, Germany, Portugal, Spain and Italy. Researchers interviewed six and a half thousand people and the results show a wide difference, especially between southern and northern Europe, on how people feel about the future of human augmentation. On average, just less than half, 46% of those surveyed, believe that people should be able to augment themselves as they wish, as it's their body. This varies from a high in Portugal of 56% to a low in the UK of 36%. A less than one in five, 19% of people Kaspersky interviewed, thought that deciding to augment oneself would be weird, and 30% would support a family member who decided to augment themselves regardless of their choice. Now, overall, more than a third, 36% of those surveyed, are optimistic about a future shared by both augmented and non-augmented people. So, how do we move forward? Who will help ensure a safe, positive future for this technology? Well, to discuss the important topics around this debate, I am joined by an international panel of experts who all have aug augmentations themselves and you will have the chance to ask questions of the panel at the end. So to do this, uh, please type to them, uh, type your questions in the ask a question box, which you should see either to the right or below the video player. If you've got your video set to full screen, by the way, you're going to need to minimize it in order to see the question box. OK, let's get started. So 
So I am delighted to welcome our panel of guests, our augmented guests, and of course we have our Kaspersky people as well who are not augmented. Uh, but let's start by introducing you to all of them together. We've got Tilly Lockley from England, a bionic model, presenter, speaker, and all-round disruptor. We've got Dr. Bertolf Mayer, who's a professor of work and economic psychology at Chemnitz University of Technology in Germany. He also has a bionic arm. We've got Victoria Modesta, a US-based bionic pop artist, creative director and futurist. And Hannes Schnorblod from Sweden, who's CEO of Disruptive Subdermals. And of course, from our host Kaspersky, we're joined by Marco Preuss, Director, Global Research and Analysis Team Europe, and David Jacoby, Deputy Head of Global Research and Analysis Team Europe. Welcome, one and all, to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today to debate some really important topics for the future of human augmentation and, of course, ramifications for safety, regulation and wider society at large. Before we dive into the debate topics, let's get to know each other a bit. I'd like to ask you each a series of questions just to understand a bit more about your own personal journey. Uh, Tilly, let's start with you. Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, hi, I'm Tilly. I think you introduced me pretty well there. Um, basically, I wasn't always like this. When I was 15 months old, I fell really, really ill with a disease called meningococcal septicemia strain B. It's a mouthful. I was basically told that, you know, I was going to die. My parents were asked to come in and see me because they couldn't be sitting in my eyes would ever open again before they like shut my body down for the machines. But obviously I'm here today, so I managed to pull through with that. But the only reason I was able to survive was because they amputated my forearms. So I'm now a double amputee. I lost both my hands. At the age of two years old upwards, I've been working with different prosthetic companies. And I just always remember thinking when I was really, really little about the lack that there really was out there. I've experienced and experimented with so many different prosthetics throughout the years, and I've done a lot of fundraising crowdfunding for that. But it also really, really always stood out to me just how it needed to be better. I think specifically for children in my case, because I was a child at the time too. But also I think if you're gonna get fluent with prosthetic arms, you're gonna wanna start from a young age. So that's kind of what I've dedicated my life to do. I kind of set that as my goal. So I set out on a mission to work with different prosthetic companies to get the best bionic arms available and out there for myself, children and adults, just other people who would like a bionic arm. They're really incredibly glamorous. Um, you know, you're a great ambassador for prosthetics. Have you seen changing attitudes over the years towards you? Yeah, I definitely have. I mean, you're saying these are glamorous here, which they definitely are, because that's how I designed them to me and that's how I wanted to express myself with them. I've seen reactions change humongously all throughout my life. I think because at the very, very beginning, I was wearing the complete opposite of these prosthetics. So incredibly realistic, high definition silicone. They had freckles, they had wrinkles, they had fingernails you could paint. And I always felt like these prosthetic arms were kind of designed to make other people around you feel comfortable, especially when you think about the fact that so many people, including myself, were offered just a glove. Like it didn't do anything, it was just a glove to kind of say, that, yeah, you look like a normal person, therefore you can be treated like a normal person. That's always the way I kind of looked at it. But it actually kind of had the opposite effect. It ended up being really, really uncanny to a lot of people. I personally was scared of them and people in the streets were very confused. I mean, it wasn't pleasant for me getting all these stares. It was never really anything negative, I don't think. But it was just the fact that people couldn't even distinguish whether it was real, whether it was fake, what was even going on. And it was quite creepy for them. These prosthetics are still available now. But just from my experience, I feel like when I was wearing these, it was very much more sympathetic. Whereas now where I wear these bionic arms, people see me in the street and they want to come up and they want to shake my hand. They feel like they're shaking hands with the future. And it gets them really, really excited, which I think is amazing. Definitely down the right route of how I would want it to be. Well, brilliant. You're a fantastic voice to have on the panel because, of course, you are speaking from the perspective of the generation that will have to live with a lot of the decisions that we make in, in terms of how we work this technology out. So thank you so much. Um, Victoria, uh, can you share a bit about your story with us, please? Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, you also did a, did a great introduction. But um, 
so I'm a bionic performance artist and uh, uh, and m my story started out uh, with an accident at birth actually and uh, um, back in the USSR and um, I got into performing arts quite early at the same time when I was about six or seven and um, I was quite lucky but it's only when I came to London at the age of 15 and I got into art and design um, and fashion that um, I decided that I needed to have a voluntary leg amputation um, which I really felt that was going to improve uh, my health and my life and my experience as an artist so I did that when I was 20 and um, since then, I've kind of dedicated my whole time to really changing the perception of how post-disability is viewed in pop culture. Because for me, when I was growing up and I was, you know, a, a little girl in a hospital, I really felt that, you know, watching MTV and Disney and Hollywood movies for me was the thing that really made me feel that, you know, you should be able to take control of your body and you should be able to transform yourself and in any way you want. So, um, you know, that kind of uh, idea really worked out for me. And um, shortly after my amputation, I just really started working and developing my career as a performing artist and um, um, as a musician. And uh, in 2012, I actually got asked to perform at the Paralympic closing ceremony, um, which was absolutely amazing. And it was the first time that I really realized the impact of this specific um, perspective that I had. You know, the fact that I was uh, wearing a prosthetic didn't make me different, but um, sort of my perspective on how uh, normalized and how ex extra fabulous it can be, uh, you know, that's the thing that really made a difference. And shortly, a couple of years later, uh, I actually did a project with Channel 4 in UK following their uh, superhuman campaign, a uh, video called Prototype, which uh, completely, I guess, transformed my life and transformed a lot of other people's lives and, you know, became viral. And uh, at the time, actually, I realized, you know, that um, how the language that we use in pop culture um, is really, really important. So we decided to announce me as the first uh bionic pop artists in the world. And, you know, it, it felt a little bit kind of tongue in cheek at the time, but I realized then that, you know, how we carry the narrative of this post-disability, post-human um, idea is really important. So, uh, and, you know, here I am uh, many years later, I've, I've moved from UK to uh, the States and I've been working with MIT Media Lab on a lot more advanced bionics and uh, also exploring uh, extending yourself with technology in multiple ways now, um, mostly through performing arts. But um, it's I'm fantastic very to, to see. Here. It's fantastic to see both you and Tilly really celebrating your um, augmentations and you know turning them into anything but a di disability. I think in many respects. Um, also speaking to us today, we've got Dr. Bertolt Mayer. Uh, Bertolt, like Tilly, you also grew up without a limb. Your left hand. Now you're. Uh, you have a very technologically advanced bionic arm. How has that affected your life? Well, of course, my disability has affected my life as anybody else uh, would with a disability. Um, I can relate very strongly to what Tilly said uh, in terms of how people interact with you and how that changes with the change of the prosthesis that you're wearing. Because when I was younger, the prosthesis that I used to wear were also this steel hook or maybe this kind of skin colored glove. And I always realized how that created awkwardness in social interactions. You know, people would stare and people would treat you with sympathy. And of course, that is a very unpleasant feeling. And when I was first fitted with a more advanced hand uh, like this one, so this is an, an island by, made by us, uh, um, what I realized was very similar to what Tilly experienced in a sense that people start treating you differently. Um, there is no more pity, but there is a positively connotated interest. People go like, oh, wow, that's cool. Can you show me how that works? And I thought that was fascinating because coolness is typically very much the opposite of disabled. So being a psychologist, uh, two years ago, we did a study to investigate whether bionics have the potential to change the stereotypes towards people with disabilities. And we did indeed find that prosthesis like this not only provide a functional benefit, but also a psychological one. 
such that the experience that I'm having and Tilly was describing and Victoria too, they actually generalize in the sense that people with physical disabilities who wear bionic prosthesis are not seen as incompetent as people with physical disabilities typically are. So we're now in a time where technological innovation has the potential to change stereotypes, to change how we see each other and to change how we interact with each other. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. Uh, you also um, do some very interesting things with your bionic arm. You've got adaptations, um, for example, music. <laughs> well, yeah, well, my uh, my passion outside of academia is, is electronic music. I'm a bit of a se maybe semi-professional DJ, and, and I also produce the one and the other tune. And um, the gear that I use is uh, analog synthesizers, and they're really difficult to operate, all the tiny knobs and buttons with the prosthesis. So we built, uh, together with my husband and a friend, we built this unique device, which we call the Synlimb, uh, which is electronics and uh, something that we got out of the 3D printer, and it can attach to my wrist instead of the hand. And then it converts the electronic signals that my prosthesis picks up from my arm that typically open and close the hand, it converts those into electronic signals that the synthesizer will understand so that I can plug in a cable in here and plug the other end of the cable into the synthesizer to control the music. So basically that feels like controlling the music with my thoughts. And of course, that just for me is just a glimpse of the possibilities that are around the corner. Yeah, I'm sure. And I'm sure musicians across the world are absolutely green with envy for that kind of ability to do as well. Um, Hammers, while our other panellists benefit from augmentation for health reasons, you actually opted to augment yourself. Can you describe what you've had implanted and how you use it? Absolutely. Yeah, so I am a biohacker with a great interest in exploring uh, microchip implants and what we could potentially do with them uh, to give you, the human body new capabilities. So I have a tiny implant in my hand which I can use to open doors or access uh, my gym, for example, or travel by train in Sweden using my chip as a ticket. But uh, based on the experiences in working with these implants over the last uh, number of years, I've also uh, started a company called Disruptive Subdermals with a couple of partners, and we are developing a new level of implants that has health sensors inside that can potentially monitor people's vital parameters. You just swipe yourself with your phone and you have a dashboard of what is happening in your body in real time. So uh, I think we're just in the beginning of this technology and what it can do for people. And my vision is really that this is not something just for the few, but really a, a solution for the masses. Mm. And you're from Sweden, where biohacking cultures, it's really advanced actually compared with many other nations. Why do you think that is? Um, and how are biohackers in Sweden choosing to augment themselves? Right. Well, um, I think the biohacking scene is in Sweden is absolutely very active and has gotten a lot of attention, not least this experimentation with implants that has really taken off over here. In fact, we had an event yesterday where a pretty big number of people decided to upgrade themselves. Uh, but ultimately, the reason why this is happening, I think, is I mean, Sweden is a relatively tech-savvy society. Uh, people here, a lot of people work in tech, a lot of people are interested in tech. Uh, you know, there's more future looking than it's backwards looking as a society. And, you know, it's fortunate to be a part of this ecosystem. Brilliant. Well, really looking forward to your contribution through today's uh, discussion as well. Um, now it's time to meet our Kaspersky people. Marco, you've been studying human organization in healthcare for many years. Uh, what trends are you seeing at the moment? Yeah, that's um, absolutely fine. I'm um, in this whole field for quite some time, also together with Hannes, we were doing um, a lot of research into uh, these areas of augmentation. Of course, one of the main drivers over the past years is uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, as we have seen with Tilly, for example, like having uh, prosthetics um, to help uh, people uh, when they're missing uh, certain pieces. Um, but of course, nowadays we're seeing also this trend that um, new technologies get more and more uh, developed and be added to the body, as we've seen with Sanas, uh, to give just more functionalities to the simple human body um, by extending it. 
And that's quite an interesting trend. Definitely is. And more on that later as well. Um, let's meet David now. Uh, David, you follow developments in human augmentation cleanly. What kind of security or regulatory concerns do you have that we'll discuss later on through the show? So my background is actually doing penetration testing and working as a professional hacker for the last 20 years. And when we see new technology, I'm always interested in saying, okay, what kind of vulnerabilities, what kind of threats, what kind of risk do we have with new technology? Because it's all not just fun and games. And I mean, we've seen in the past, for example, when we started to put network card and communication protocols into normal household devices like a a refrigerator or a vacuum cleaner or, uh, you know, a TV. Um, suddenly we have all these devices talking to each other and also talking to hackers. And when hackers talk to devices, they uh, something can go wrong, right? And I'm afraid that we will see the same thing with uh, human augmentation. And we've seen some cases with, you know, uh, pacemakers being vulnerable to certain attacks and so on. And I just think before we end up in, in a scenario where, this is the norm to modify and augment our bodies. I think we need to look at the regulations and put some um, legislation on the companies actually building these kind of devices. Absolutely. Um, great opening thoughts from all of our panelists. Those are the panelists. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Okay, we have a broad range of experience here. This debate is going to be absolutely fascinating. Um, don't forget, you can ask questions. Uh, let's dive straight in and talk about living with augmentation. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to talk to all of you really about how your augmentation has improved your day-to-day -day life. I mean, we've heard a little bit from you already, but Tilly, can you expand on what sort of improvements you've got in your life because of your augmentation? Yeah, definitely. Well, I think having a prosthetic limb and um, the other people wearing bionic parts will relate to this. But it is, at the end of the day, a replacement for my limb. So it is an awful lot for me physically. Being a double amputee as well, a lot of people who get these specific hero arm bionic arms only are missing the one hand, which is why my opinion is very, very valid to the company, because I'm one of their few people who are missing both. So you can imagine like there's a lot of pressure on the arms to be able to do what I want them to do like all the particular movements and they have to be very very precise in order to, for me to do anything I would like to do with them um I've just definitely I've definitely feel like they are they like definitely become a part of me in a way wearing them as much as I do I wear them every single day something that they do really really help me with is multitasking being the double upper arm amputee that I am because you would have to do everything with your two arms together but something else which I think is very very important and a lot of people kind of skim over a lot of the time is how much these bionic arms have helped me mentally as I mentioned I've received many different realistic prosthetics in the past and I kind of feel like I've been programmed from a young age to think that it's not okay to show these differences and that you have to blend in I mean I don't think that was it wasn't like with bad intent anybody saying this but they just never stopped to think you know what do the target audience who are going to wear bionicoms actually want they never actually stood out a questionnaire or a survey but when Open Bionics, who make these Bionicoms, did do that, they had everybody draw their dream arm. And you'll be interested to know that not one person drew a hand that looked like your average hand. When we actually are asked about what we want, we all want cool superhero arms, you know what I mean? And I feel like these arms, that's something that they've done an awful lot for me. Just um, taking away the awkward moments, like we were saying earlier, it's very, very much more fun, like, in social interactions, I think people would get kind of scared. They don't know whether to shake your hand. They don't know, really know how to react. However, with these bionicoms, there's so much more excitement. And I feel like for me as the user and seeing more positive reactions rather than quite negative or uncomfortable reactions, which you don't really want to your body, you know what I mean? It's definitely helped me so much mentally. And I feel like my mental health and my confidence, my self-esteem has come on leaps and bounds since using these hero arms.
Do they give you any additional strength? You know, because I mean, they, machines, you, we typically expect, expect machines to be able to, you know, grip the tops of things, for example. Do you, do you have firmer grip than you would have if you had uh, not the augmentations? Um, I get this question a lot, like, oh my gosh, how much can you lift? Is this superhuman? And like, it's not to the point where I'm going to punch through a wall. However, something I do think is that I can't actually feel anything in the arm currently. So, you know, if you would like to metaphorically, of course, theoretically, if you were to punch somebody, it would maybe hurt your fist. Whereas for me, I wouldn't feel a thing. And it's a solid end there. So it would definitely pack a punch, not speaking from experience or anything. As well, <laughs> I can't like feel anything. So I could like touch fire for to for a certain extent, like without it melting the hand, but like I wouldn't be able to feel that in a sense. So there's yeah. some kind of cool advancements I like to bring up. So don't mess with Tilly, basically. That's yeah. the, the moral of that story. <laughs> Hannah, so now you've obviously taken you know it upon yourself to augment. Um, that I can see the convenience, you know, of not having to carry uh, you know a wallet or a card to get on the bus or the phone. Are there any other ways that the, the, the augmentation has enhanced your life? Absolutely, in a number of ways. I mean, principally, uh, the way I see this integrating technology with the body is all about removing the clutter in everyday life. The, the morning when you walk out the door, you don't want to check all your pockets or your purse for, do I have my keys, my wallet, my, my Fitbit and whatnot. These things should just be part of you, just like all the organs we were born with. So my view is that we can take these technologies and we can simplify our lives to a great extent. Yes, I don't need to bring my uh, wallet to places and I don't need all the keys I used to use anymore. But ultimately, I really think that uh, integrating technology into the human body on you know healthy persons uh, for voluntary reasons must also add significant value. I mean, it cannot just be a gimmick that people do for fun, but we should be able to create functions that make this worthwhile for millions of people to 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 buy this technology and so that's the quest i'm on i would like to give people the opportunity in all corners of the world to for example get real-time access to their own body data and mm -hmm. uh, that's the vision that we have uh, Victoria, um, in your perspective, obviously your um, your performance work is enhanced by um, by the augmentation. Any other things you want to mention? Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I'll echo Tilly, you know, because I, I do feel like most of the time, you know, you just focus on the wildest possibility, right? Because over the past years, like I've had a I've had a prosthetic that had the world's smallest Tesla coil in it. Um, ones that have lights, ones that have been turned into a musical instrument or a shape of a spike. Um, and, you know, but on a, on a daily basis, um, I think the funniest one is probably when I wear heels because um, your your other foot doesn't really get tired. You're kind of wearing the same shoe <laughs> regardless, of, um, regardless of your heel height. So occasionally that comes in handy, especially with kind of line of work that I do. Um, so, yeah. Imagine, uh, Berto. I, I looked at you playing with your augmentation uh, with your prosthetic just now, and I just wanted to know: is it, is it really easy to get the top lids off jars? Right, you just sort of do go go around like that. <laughs> Bertolt, I think we may have it lost Bertolt. It is Bert. relatively oh, easy to get the tips uh, <laughs> of jars. Oh, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, I sorry. can. No, it is. To get the tips of jars, and it ties into my experience that it's the little things, bicycle or to drive the car without any notifications. And these little things are what make the big difference in your everyday life. But these are all just functional. And I would like to reiterate what Tilly already alluded to, and also Victoria, it's really also a psychological difference that it makes because technology. All of that kind of conveys a sense about your disability changes how people interact with you, turn changes how you feel about your own disability. So to that regard, the the upside are two the upsides are twofold, functional and psychological. 
It, one of the things that I, I'm interested in is whether or not there's any sense of discrimination um, or judgment from society. Now, we've kind of mentioned it already, but um, Berto, do you do you sort of sense a change in the wind? Have you experienced discrimination or a judgment? Well, I think everyone with a physical disability has experienced that to some regard. And I'm not talking about like outright being went out to fancy dinner with my in-laws and the main course was a piece of meat. And when it arrived, the waiter had cut my piece of meat in small bits. But of course, my plate was the only one that had been tempered with in that way because apparently the waiter thought that me wearing a prosthetic hand would be unable to do that and you know it's just a tiny detail but it just shows you know people look at you and think that you are not as competent as able-bodied individuals and that is annoying especially in the sum uh, of things it's not that tiny little instant in itself but it's you know the sum of them you experience in everyday life. And Tilly, um, you know, there's growing support for um, human augmentation among the technology field, but do you feel that ge the general public are beginning to be a bit more supportive? I definitely do think the general public are becoming more supportive. I mean, if we think about like 10 years ago um, and like the generation before that, they wouldn't think for a second that we would be where we are now and they wouldn't really, I don't know, I don't really think, in my opinion, in my brain, I don't really think they would be thinking so much about how at some point everybody's going to have robotic limbs. To be honest, I think that there's growing support because if you look at the type of things that we do for entertainment now, there's so much around sci-fi. Like, look at Star Wars, look at all these video games. And I think that support is continuously going to grow because it's becoming more and more common to see that on our TV screens. And we all love a bit of sci-fi, if that's your cup of tea. I know I definitely do. And I feel like with my generation sat watching that still now at home, they're seeing, they're seeing this on their screen and it's labeled fantasy, right? But if they think that this fantasy can in fact become reality, then it definitely brings a lot more excitement around it. I think as well, I got these bionicoms and these cases were actually made for me by a like a local business and she just asked for some cases which I was happy to give her and she asked if I if I wanted her to kind of glam them up. So that was obviously somebody within the general public who wants to get involved and see what they could do and experiment. I feel like people are having a lot of fun with it now and people are a lot more open to it. You're still going to have the people who are just like, no, totally against it and very, very stuck in that way. However, the majority, I feel like, are open to it and I feel like that's only going to increase with time. Absolutely. Uh, Hannah's, uh, sorry, uh, Vic Victoria, let's, is that your experience from the other side of the uh, the pond? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. I mean, uh, Tilly is correct that, you know, so much has changed over the last decade. You know, I remember when, when you know, I first started kind of coming out into the world with, you know, more stylized prosthetics. I mean, there was literally sort of nothing out there. And, you know, it was, I have to say that it was really, really daunting. And what's something that is happening that's really interesting is, you know, because we have the sci-fi culture, right? And everyone's sort of comfortable with that. But then at the same time, there isn't a lot of practical sort of examples in the real world um, that are happening um, where people are able to kind of get their head around the fact that actually physical augmentation can be normalized. It can be something that is accepted. It's not scary and it's not taboo. And I feel like um, I feel like actually, you know, people who have who like myself have had to augment themselves through, you know, a physical illness or, or disability. You know, we are kind of sort of paving this, bridging this gap. I think, um, you know, in actually sort of showing showing the sci-fi reality you know, in the physical world, which, you know, I, I do believe is the thing that's really helping. Um, and also, you know, what I think um, what was said earlier is that, um, 
you, you know, there's there's two things happening here. One is, you know, how do we view disability and post-disability and how do we digest that? But also, you know, the public, you know, based on your um, on your research is, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about augmentation for able-bodied people. And, you know, I do feel like, um, you know, coming at it from an angle of uh, of doing it for health reasons kind of disarms the conversations a little bit and actually kind of showcases, you know, a, a, a good side to it, which I think is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very quickly on this topic, Hannahs, we're going to end with you on this topic. Uh, you know, obviously, as somebody who's augmented through choice, um, the survey um, or the research said that 46 percent, nearly half of Europeans believe people should be free to augment as they wish. Do you what what kinds of reactions do you get? Do you think um, it's going to become more normalized as we become more um, sort of familiar with augmentation for medical reasons? I think the public acceptance is is already out there. As Tilly rightly points out, we are a generation. We have grown up with computer games and sci-fi movies and whatnot. Being, you know, having technology integrated into your body is a perfectly normal thing for people who have grown up uh, in the last three decades. And uh, when I'm out and talking about tech and hosting chip implant parties, the 95% of the reactions I get is interest and curiosity. Yes, there's always a few skeptics. That's great. That's the way it should be. And that's how we evolve with the technology. But in my view, yeah, the public acceptance for tattoos, for uh, implants and augmentations is definitely there. Brilliant. Well, that is a snapshot of life with augmentations. Thank you so much. Hannes. OK, it's time to get serious now. Let's talk about connectivity and security. Any device that is connected has the potential to be hacked or taken over by cyber criminals or crash and the connectivity doesn't work, it's, which I believe was what happened with Paul Bertolt earlier. We've got him on audio with a still shot. So don't be don't be alarmed if his face doesn't move when he's talking, everybody. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's fair to say that everything has the, the potential to have problems um, if it's got connectivity involved. How much of a threat is this really and how do our panellists feel about it? Um, let's, Bertolt, should we, should we give this sort of uh, still image voice only method a try with you? Um, let's talk about um, your bionic devices. They're connected, right? And how have you used connectivity? Yes, they are. So my hand connects to an app on my mobile phone that is used to configure the hand and to remote operate some of the scripts. But of course, at the same time, the phone is connected to the Internet. So in theory, this technology makes it possible for someone over the Internet to hack my prosthesis. And that's just one example of the new issues that spring up around connected devices that are part of your body. So in this future, not only of medical technology, but of augmentation, of course, security is vital. And these kind of connections require a, a level of security that I think we don't have yet in household consumables. Mm. Victoria, I mean, again, for yourself, um, as a performer, you are fairly high profile. Unfortunately, high profile people can become targets just because of their high profileness. Um, does, is it something that you worry about? Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say, you know, with my work, I, I, I delve into a lot more kind of wider issues of just generally like the future of our identity and how we are extending ourselves with technology. And I do feel like, in my experience, the idea of how your any of your personal data that is coming out, whether inside of your body, whether you're typing it, whether you're thinking it, you know, I do feel like there needs to be a, a universal kind of personal protection of some kind. And, you know, I talk about it quite extensively um, you know, when we were thinking about uh, a digital sort of extension and prosthetic of yourself, like, you know, having a, a digital avatar or, you know, even talking to your any of your devices, you know, and I, I, I honestly feel that the same principle 
should really, you know, apply to to the signals that are coming out of your body. And, you know, some of the more advanced uh, pr- sort of prosthetics that, for example, are being developed at um, MIT Media Lab. Uh, it's interesting, legs and arms are like really different um, things to, to consider. And with legs, so much more computer power has to go on. It really has to calculate so many things of what terrain you're in and stuff. And so recently, you know, I have, I've had some conversations about, you know, uh, getting some implants put in, in my leg that would essentially control bionic ankle. And, you know, the implications of security are, are pretty high, pretty much, you know, but it, it does, I do feel like it's a, a universal thing that needs to be established for the general public to feel like they are, they, you know, the int- this intimate connection with technology is protected um, on some kind of a wider scale. Mm. Tilly, are your arms connected as well? Um, they're not to the point where they don't, they don't have an app. They're not like Bluetooth connection. I'm not too clued up, honestly. I'm just a user. But if there is some sort of connectivity, then it's literally just in the lab but of my knowledge they test the user's muscle sensitivity um I don't think they that's really in a database I think they put it into the sensor and you get along with your life but they do have the sensitivity option options like saved online somewhere so I don't really think it's that too prone to hacking um as well something that I do think in my case which is better I feel like it would be obviously worse if this was a chip we're talking about like inside of someone particularly in the brain that's when things could go a bit you know not not too great but for me it's literally just a prosthetic and it's so simple for me just to take it off you know it's there's no wires or anything attached so if should anything ever happen I could just take it off it's not a part of me and I mean it's not gonna like it's a hand it's not gonna like run away or anything and the only thing that could ever be hacked at the moment is sensitivity of my muscles which is just gonna make the hand open quicker or slower so I don't have too much concerns as of now but I definitely think eventually there will be some kind of app and there will be more connection as technology advances and as do the company so I'm not too concerned as of now but it's definitely interesting to hear about for the future. Yeah, and of course, Tilly set us up brilliantly to come to you now, Hannah's. I mean, do you, you obviously you you've got your your chip um, internally. Do you think um, that there is a lot of public concern over the safety of human augmentations, and and do you can have concern over hackers for your device? Well, you know. Uh, I'm both a user of this implant technology and also a provider at scale of this technology to to thousands of people. So obviously there are some super important both human rights dimensions to to this tech platform as well as cybersecurity matters that are critical importance. For example, if there is an implant in my body, uh, is it owned by me or is it owned by a company? Maybe I have the right to use it because I pay a monthly subscription. Maybe this is of vital importance for me to get the data from the implant and then I stop paying. Uh, Do they have the right to shut off uh, a device which is inside of my body? Does a company have the right to push, for example, updates into uh, an implant that sits inside my body, which I may or may not consent to? Uh, And what about the data protection and control? So these are some tremendously important dimensions of uh, both cybersecurity and human rights that we need a much broader conversation in society about because there is a fundamental difference between the internet of things, internet of stuff and connected devices in our homes that we can just walk away from and the moment when technology truly becomes integrated in our own bodies. So uh, I appreciate this opportunity and that Kaspersky is putting the spotlights on this matter because there's a lot of questions that we as industry operators and as as users and innovators in this tech space that we need to answer up to. Uh, how, How do we define the limits of individual ownership versus sort of copyright and corporate ownership? That's not an easy question to answer. No, there are a lot of difficult questions around uh, this, as with so many other technological um, advances, to be honest. Um, Berto, as an academic, do you feel your augmentations are safe? Is there any concerns about hacking? 
Of course. I mean, hacking is always a concern and the new possibilities open up a new can of worms when it comes to hacking. There is a book out there called Future Crimes by Mark Goodman that outlines the new scenarios that become possible for hacking in a future where humans augment themselves. And one of the examples is, for example, a group of hackers who came up with, and this is not fiction, it has already happened, with a device that's able to send out a Bluetooth signal that causes a body-worn insulin pump that certain to give off a potential lethal doses of insulin to the wearer so that it actually becomes possible, although this is quite drastic, to kill someone with a hack. And that's something that people are, of course, afraid of because these kind of imageries are conveyed in pop culture and super villain movies and so forth. Of course, and, and you know, it does become very dramatic. Um, Marco, let's get a bit of a, a sort of a, a perspective from Kaspersky about the whole idea of concern about cyber criminals being able to um, hack into connected technologies and how that relates to augmentations. Do you see a lot of concern about that, Marco? Of, of course, uh, <laughs> that's very easy to say yes. Um, I mean, it's a new technology and um, I'm always a big fan of learning from the past. And when we just look back a few decades ago, uh, first there were the PCs, Nobody really cared about security. What happens? We have seen it with mass infections. Um, then we had uh, mobile phones, smartphones, um, and all these mobile devices. Nobody really cared about security. What happened? Infections and attacks. Um, the next was IoT, of course. And nobody really cared about security. What happens? Uh, mass infections, uh, really big impacts on the internet infrastructure. Um, these new technologies in terms of augmentation, whether they're on body or also going in body, we need to take care about the topic of security before they're on the market. It, this is really no question in this field. But as Hannes also pointed out, very, very important. It's not only about security, it's also about rights and privacy, because these, all of these technologies, similar to what we have already in IoT, which this is maybe some kind of an addition, are first of all kind of sensors. So you're sensing um, certain aspects of the body of your life and then the technology behaves in a certain way. Um, so we definitely need to take care and consider all of these different areas and make them secure and relevant in terms of privacy uh, protection, uh, that it's really usable by the people. I remember there was a conversation um, beginning around five years ago around Internet of Things technology and how it could potentially be the asbestos of the future, as in we install all of this stuff, technology into our lives. And, you know, suddenly there's a problem with it. And as you said, Marco, if you haven't got the security aspects sorted out before the installation, then you suddenly have a huge retrospective uh, or retroactive um, um, sort of changes to make. Um, do you think, Hannahs, that there is, you know, concern and sort of like dithering around um, these kind of issues? Do you think that this might limit public interest and uptake in voluntary augmentation? Well, um, let me tell you that, unfortunately, as as we've learned uh, many times over, people are concerned about fun, you know, usability and security often comes third or fourth. So. Uh, what typically happens again and again is that some, some new innovation happens, everyone goes into it with great enthusiasm, and then the smart security guys come in the end and say, hey guys, you know, you need to care about these things. Principally, yes, absolutely, uh, augmentation tech has to mature into all the safety protocols uh, that this critical type of technology requires. Fortunately though, we can learn a lot from wearables. So there is a well-established systems of data protection and uh, privacy rights and uh, all these dimensions that are uh, applicable also to augmentation tech. So I'm comfortable that this industry will, will grow uh, and that will deal with problems as they appear. 
Yeah, Hannah's makes a really good point, David, um, which I want to come to you on. Do you, you know that we do have a lot of technologies and and, and knowledge uh, to apply from decades of learning, uh, you know, particularly companies like Kaspersky. Do you see a lot of the solutions, security solutions that we use currently successfully being applicable to augmentation or is it going to be a whole new field of, of security that needs to arise out of this? No, I mean, I've been hacking software and hardware for 20 years. And the funny thing is, like, if I look at new technology, I'm finding the same type of problems and same type of security issues as I did in the software, which is like 20 or 30 years old. Um, but I think the problem here, and I think all the speakers and panelists is spot on, but we need to talk about the relationship between humans and te technology. Because... If you look at uh, some of the technologies that we use today, an email address or a social media account, or I mean, just a credit card with NFC or something, imagine that you would live without that kind of technology today. Let's imagine that you would live out, um, live without technology, such as uh, communications with hospitals. So if you go to the hospitals, they're able to get information about you that wasn't possible 20 or 30 years ago. The relationship between humans and uh, technology is very, very important because until it becomes part of our lives, such as what we have today with email addresses or all that mobile phones and all the other technology that we use, it's just fun and games. But when we start, like Hannes, no offense to you, but it's fun and games to put an F NFC chip in, in your hand, but what if it's inside your body from birth? What if it's technology that you know is demanded by governments or or even private companies, and you rely on that technology in such a sense that you can't live without that. Like the um, the pump for diabetics, when it becomes a very narrow relationship and you're forced to live with that technology, security risks might cause some really big problems. And saying that, uh, I mean that, I mean we will have problems in the future if we start looking at, you know, the legislation and the, the vulnerabilities that might arise right now. Because today, it's, I shouldn't say just fun and games, but today we don't rely on, on, on human augmentation um, to save our lives at large. Of course, there's some individual who do that, but at large, we don't. But as soon as that starts happening, we might have some really big issues out there. Absolutely. Do you think, Marco, um, that we're seeing technologies um, in the security space that will work? Um, and, uh, you know, as long as we get things, you know, at the ground level and, in, in, and actually put the augmented world on top of solid security foundations, do you, do you see a bright future for that? Marco? <laughs> well, of course. I, I, I see a bright future for this technology. Um, and I mean, it's nothing we can really stop. It's a natural process. I mean, it's, I mean, Hannes already pointed it out and all the others before already mentioned it partly. I mean, the technologies, as I also just said before, we had the computers, then the mobiles we had on our body. Then we had the sensors, uh, like the smartwatches on whatever on our body. And then the next logical step is, of course, something which also goes into the body in order to um, help humans on one side or to add new functionalities. So it's just a natural development process and technology which we are seeing. Um, but all of these points addressed here we definitely need, need to take care of. Um, they're essential. And I think we have quite a lot of things to learn and to develop in order to protect these technologies and also to protect the humans, as also David pointed it out. Um, these are all many, many different concerns and they're very, very important. And we really need to raise these topics and work in these topics all together. It's a question not only on security vendors or the vendors of such kind of technologies, but also on the society, on the government, the regulators. Um, we need to work together to make this a good future and not what we have seen in many, many uh, sci-fi movies and books, that it's this dystopian kind of new world 
sorry, we don't want that. We want a nice future for all the upcoming uh, generations, right? We don't want that uh, yeah, crazy frames we've seen. It makes for a good Hollywood movie script, but uh, it's not what we need in our real lives at all. I think we can all agree with that. <laughs> well, it seems clear that connection and security will remain a vital part of the conversation going forwards. Thank you all. Okay, let's move on now to learn more about the role of manufacturers in the future direction of human augmentation. Uh, some of our panelists have been working closely with manufacturers, we've already heard, to develop the augmentation technology that they're using. Um, so really, you guys are ideally placed to help answer some of these questions and address this topic. Um, let's um, start with uh, Bertolt. I'd like to ask you, does human augmentation have a potential, do you think, to aid in education? I mean, of course it, it does. Um, just think about the possibilities that lie ahead when we start integrating augmented reality technologies, for example, in our field of vision. I mean, how great would that be to get a kind of cues and hints in terms of what to do next, where to orient yourselves when you do some sort of technical trainings? I mean, I, I keep forgetting names. I am terrible with forgetting names. And just for my teaching, it would be so great to have like, like a little device that kind of projects the name of the person above their head in my field of vision. I would love to have something like that, right? So I think the possibilities, of course, uh, are endless. Um, and not only in education, also in science, we're currently trying to develop kind of a, a diminished virtual reality environment where people can experiment in a virtual way uh, um, to experience having a body part removed and re being replaced with an artificial one. So to kind of, in a virtual environment, give able-bodied people the experience of using a, a bionic limb and all these kinds of technologies to not only advance science and technology but also advance us on a societal level to make us more easy to make it more easier to step into somebody else's shoes and see the world from their perspective. And Tilly, I know you've done a lot of work, you know, as, a, as an ambassador and helping people understand um, the, you know, the augmentation process and meeting people. Um, do you feel that there's a place for um, them in, in um, education as well? Yeah, well, definitely. I know, like, for me, as I said earlier, it was very much about getting something available for children. And when you think about children, they go to school every single day. And when I was growing up, I learned to write and I, I had to learn to do all of those things. But obviously, I'm the only person in my class without hands at the time. I don't know how to teach that in a way, you know, because it's, it's not a common situation to be in and teachers it's like literally when you're in a situation like that and you're missing limbs I feel like it's literally all about oh we've just lost your audio so let's just uh, see if we can get that audio back sorry we'll come back to you on that Tilly straight away um it, Bertolt let's run back to you real quick because obviously you've um made an adaptation for your music um, uh, you know, sort of work. Do you think that adaptations could be made for education in the same way? Well, yes, I think in the advent of the 3D printer and more accessible technologies to everyone, I think what I admire most is the potential of empowering people who augment themselves, who have disabilities to kind of design their own technology, their own processes, their own devices uh, with custom functionality and custom coverings. I mean, for example, what, what Tilly is wearing there, she said it earlier, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool to express yourself. Um, so any kind of tooling that will allow the broader public a more empowering approach to these technologies in the sense that they're not concentrated in the hands of a few organizations, but maybe allow everyone to build something like this. I mean, look, I'm not even an engineer, right? I just know a little bit about electronics. And with the help of a few friends and the wonders of the internet, we were able to pull this together. And if we can do it, anybody can. 
And Tilly, there is a huge maker community within tech generally, isn't there? Have you have you sort of experienced that whole attitude yourself then? Yeah, definitely. I've been working with a company. I've been working with so many companies, but the company I'm currently working with, I've been with them and wearing their technology for about four or five years now. And my kind of role in it all is to always bring new ideas to the table. That's what I'm there for. When you think about prosthetic devices, it's a niche market, a very target audience, and you can be the most talented engineer in the world, but you will not be able to make a prosthetic device, which is really, really effective without the help of somebody who's actually going to wear that device. That's where all the testing comes into place. And it's really necessary. It's essential for the product to be able to do well, because you can't test it if you've got a hand. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I come in with it all. And I recently sent a long list, a long, long, long list of all of my dreams and all of my wishes that I want to be in the prosthetic arm. I have already had a say in a lot of things in the arm. So at the very, very beginning, there was like little to no ventilation. So that was a bit of a problem. And I was walking around San Diego in the heat that it is there and there was no air getting to my arm. So that was pretty uncomfortable, kind of painful in a way. Oh, my audio's just dropped out again. That's, uh, it's so frustrating, isn't it? I wish we could augment a permanent, unbreakable connection, um, internet connection <laughs> to all of our cameras. Let's see, have we got you back? Hello. Yes, she's back. Okay. Yes. So you've obviously been working with, um, you know, sort of manufacturers. Do you do you see that trend sort of, you know, being big enough? Are enough manufacturers of these devices working with people who are going to use them, or does more need to be done? Tilly. Do you know? Uh, let, 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 let's. Let's move on. Victoria, what do you think about people, you know, companies working um, with um, people who are going to be users? Do you do you think enough companies are working like Tilly's working with a, a, her arm provider? Um, I don't think enough people, I don't think feel like enough companies are really doing that. Um, I mean, I have a lot more experience, I would say, um, in in the sort of cultural space and you know there is definitely a lot of effort all the time you know to provide grants for you know experiments and I do I do feel like you know um, us all getting together and actually experimenting with technology and understanding what some of the issues might be are really important um, you know I feel like with with medical devices especially mobility devices it's a little bit more straightforward um, you know a from my experience, you know, with, with prosthetics, you know, most companies would have different sort of user cases um, that they study pretty closely. But, um, you know, one of the things that for me I feel is missing really is, is this idea that, you know, a lot of these medical devices are also lifestyle devices and the opportunities of that and, in I don't feel like enough people are exploring that and you know that is where a lot of the really fun opportunities and also more interesting problems are going to arise I think. I definitely think having voices like yours and Tilly's and Bertolt actually you know people out there um, you know celebrating their augmentations um, will really help push the conversation in that direction. David what do you see um, from the survey data about these sort of attitudes from the manufacturing side of working together with people who are going to be using the products? I think that's one of the most important things that we have to do. We have to work with the people who's actually using the technology. And I know that I'm referring a, uh, a lot to the IoT era that we had a few years ago, like five or 10 years ago, um, when we had a lot of multimedia companies uh, putting um, connectivity into their uh, whatever kind of gaming devices or entertainment devices. Their main product line was not something that was supposed to have internet con connectivity from the beginning. They took like a smart TV or just a normal TV and made it so-called smart by putting a Wi-Fi modem uh, inside. And 
I don't want that to happen when it comes to augmentation. Just look at this conference that we're having right now. We're having issues with the microphone, with the internet. I mean, it puts so much fuel on my fire that technology is not always working, right? And as I said, if we have a very tight relationship with technology, we want that relationship to work, right? So working with people who is actually going to use it, who has feedback, who has knowledge and a history, um, just you know makes the entire development process so much stronger than just having vendors who think about money um, develop cool products, so to say. We need the community to tell the vendors, this is what we want, this is how we're going to use this, and then we can also include security into that process. Absolutely. And, um, you know, don't forget, if you have questions that you want to ask any of our um, speakers, then we can um, ask them at the end. We've got time set aside. Uh, all you need to do is pop the question into the ask the question box, which you should see either to the right or below the video player. And if you have us on full screen, you'll have to obviously minimize in order to catch sight of that. Hopefully, You've got lots of questions. Um, let's talk a little bit now about our final area of discussion, which is going to be around the regulation and, you know, what to happen to make sure that the future of human augmentation is um, not only safe, but also ethical and properly monitored. Now, just 27% of those uh, interviewed for the survey, for the research, um, believe that the augmented um, that augmented people need special representation in government, and 41% are actually even opposed to that idea. So it's that old adage, isn't it? Sort of you, you over-regulate or under-regulate, um, and lots of people fall on different sides of the fence. Um, let's ask all of you, first of all, do you think human augmentation requires a set of commonly agreed standards. Uh, let's come to Victoria first on that one, if I may. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, okay, so on the one hand, I do believe, you know, that that is necessary. Um, I do feel like there is, you know, sort of the more DIY approach to body hacking does kind of scare people off and you know for people like myself who tends to you know work with institutions and brands and sort of like you know really puts a lot of effort I feel like um you know this idea of kind of DIY body hacking um and and the cyborg concept has been sort of not great for me like I, I yeah I feel like that's something that I have to talk quite a little bit to sort of separate and divide my work um, so I do feel like, you know, there needs to be, um, there needs to be sort of, um, controlled experiments, I suppose. Maybe that's, that's the best way to put it, you know, because I feel like that the, how the image of all of that actually develops is just as important as the technology itself, because, you know, um, when you think about how our society is starting to address diversity or the fact that we're all actually different and the way we see each other in the media should be, uh, you know, the category should should be expanded, you know, gives you a perspective of how far behind we are when it comes to, you know, the general public accepting that actually, you know, you might be able to uh, change yourself with technology. So, you know, it's, 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 I, I agree to what was said before that, you know, all of these things kind of need to be moved in tangent and, you know, the kind of projects that hit the headlines and the kind of things that really get out there, you know, they're really shaping um, the way people are, um, are seeing this. And, um, you know, so, uh, but, but, you know, at the same time, it's like, you know, there's the overcoming physical disability of some sort with technology and, you know, and people sort of starting to understand that and accept that. And then there is regular people, um, you know, already in, interfacing with technology that they opted in for, like everything on the internet and their personal data and stuff, you know. And I feel like if both of these bookends, you know, if we keep doing a really great job, then uh, the stuff in between where you opt in to physically augment yourself without medical needs, you know, might become something that is a little bit less taboo. 
It is interesting because, you know, we do uh, opt into a lot of things on the Internet. But I think it's, it's, it's widely believed to be the terms of service. Have you read the terms of service? Tick. Yes. That's sort of widely to believe the biggest lie on the Internet because nobody's ever read them. So I think there needs to be. Uh, Bertolt, you, you, I would suggest that we need um, proper education, um, really transparent education, but also would a commonly agreed set of standards stifle innovation in some way, maybe? No, I don't. I don't think it would. I think we do, in fact, need common rules and legislations because we've been talking about augmentation here by and, and we've been referring to two actually quite different things. The one thing is medical therapy. Nobody would have any ethical objections to, you know, Victoria having a prosthetic leg or Tilly and me having a prosthetic arm. I don't see any ethical considerations that are necessary beyond, beyond what we already have. But we're now seeing the potential that Hannes represents that able-bodied people choose to put technology into their body to augment themselves beyond what is considered quote unquote normal. So on the one hand side, augmentation technology brings people like myself who are societally considered below the standard towards the standard and people seem to be absolutely okay with that but as soon as we talk about bringing people who are perceived as inside of the standard like to a superhuman level people are not okay with that and that's what our data shows that what's that creates envy it, it comes across as quote-unquote cheating Think about this weird discussion that we had in the context of the Paralympic Games of Paralympic athletes being called, being accused of techno doping. Yeah, that that it, suddenly it's an unfair advantage to have a, a prosthetic leg. This is kind of the, the middle ground between between these two areas. And of course, we need to discuss as a society and will ultimately lead to lawmaking. What is permissible in terms of elective technology to bring in your to bring into your own body to do an extreme thought experiment, would it be acceptable to cut off a completely healthy limb in order to replace it with a future bionic limb that's more capable than the biological one? Would, should that be legal? Currently, it is not. Um, and, and these are the important questions that we need to ask ourselves. And we need to ask these questions also in the context of the business interests behind them. Because, mm. look, I'm, I'm in touch with a lab and they made this chip that's supposed to help people with dementia um, to remember things better. But this chip can also be used for healthy individuals and it will increase their memory capacity. So it's this dual use problematic. And which one of these uses will make more money? Which one, pro which one promises a larger profit? Which one will a startup invest into? And it will definitely be the second option because it's a larger market. So there's a lot of money to be made. And this will drive ethical considerations and potentially sideline them. And that's why I firmly believe that we need legislation because, you know, our econo economy will not sort it out on its own. Yeah, absolutely. I can see we've got questions coming in. So I'm going to just dash through the end of this discussion so we can have a chance to get to them. Um, Hannes, I yeah, I really wanted to come to you, actually, because obviously, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the, the medical um, uh, augmentations. And for yourself, what do you feel about um, the standards and um, regulations that could or could not be applied to your field? So I think that uh, we have in fact, excellent and well covering legislation already across the European Union in this new medical device directive, which covers these very comprehensively. There are thorough uh, processes required, there is testing and validation and audits, etc. And this has been in place for many years and is currently being updated. And this new medical device uh, regulation will apply from um, May this year. So I can't speak for the whole world, but I think these things are ultimately very well covered. And most things that you stick into the human body fall under this legislation. So it's already being managed very well by our legislators. Now, I want to, I mean, there are many brilliant points brought up by the other speakers here, and I can just briefly comment on, I think, a couple of them. Uh, I wanted to say that for me, it's of crucial importance exactly to have as many users as possibly involved in these technologies, they must be 
open, they must be have democratic access, they must have broad access, and there must be a deep understanding of how these technologies work, because we, we know that all technologies can be used positively for people, and they can be used against their interests uh, in other ways. And these two cases are just as important to have a knowledge about, which is why we need to have this very broad public conversation about augmentation tech. What can it do? What can it also be applied to do, which people may not want? What if they're going to put a chip in my grandma in the nursing home? Well, now that I know this technology very well, I can question uh, an authority that has you know, such an idea and say, well, if you're going to do it, you must apply this protocol and you must not do this and that because I do this from a position of knowledge. But ultimately, ultimately, guys, I don't want us to lose track of what human augmentation technology really is about. It's about creating a much, much better future for everyone on this planet. It's about opening new opportunities, new ways of improving our health, new ways of self-expression and giving new functions simply making people's lives greater, more exciting, sensory enhancement, uh, better understanding of biometric variables, better understanding of our own vital systems. So all these things human augmentation technology can give us, and we should not forget the potential wonderful upsides of a broad application of these technologies, just because we are worried that they may be abused uh, for some reason. I do wonder, I mean, we start talking about regulation of any innovative tech sector and, and you know the question has to be asked is the regulatory body you know are, is politics capable of moving at a speed that is fast enough to offer any kind of sensible legislation um to uh, to evolving innovative technologies david do you do, do you see this as being an area where we're going to struggle the politics are going to struggle to keep up with us I worked a lot with the European Union um, with, when it comes to putting some kind of standard for IoT products. And what I learned from that experience is that we need to at least have a bare minimum saying, okay, if it's a medical device, this is the, the least security or this is the least functionality or this is the least type of support that we, that we can give this type of device. And we have to do that for the same for every technology that we're using, basically, not just medical devices, because um, we're missing that. There's a lot of things that we use in our daily lives that's not regulated, that doesn't have any so-called bare minimum um, types of security layer. And I think to do it on a political level is difficult. We have to work in synergy with the biohacking community and the users and um, politics takes a lot of time. I think that the, the security, not the security vendors, but the, the technology vendors can act as um, regulars in this case. And the politicians can learn from the technology vendors to speed up the entire process. But of course, we need the legal aspect from the politicians and uh, to actually have some kind of uh, uh, law about this, right? I think maybe starting with a with a, a sort of set of standards, agreed standards, is is probably a good point. I remember I chaired a Council um, of Europe um, legislative meeting, and they spent two hours arguing about the wording of the first paragraph. Um, you know, in case it wasn't inclusive enough for you know all the different countries involved. So I think we need to get over that hurdle with politics and actually just you know get straight down to the nuts and bolts of the legislation. Right. Um, that is the end of my questions, but now it is time to move on to your questions. So the floor is open for questions. Uh, we have 12 minutes. Um, so let's see what we can get through. Um, first question, this comes from an audience member. What does it cost to acquire and maintain an augmentation device? Uh, what can you say about the availability of augmentation devices uh, now and in the future? So is it going to be possible to become part of healthcare and who will have access to it? So, you know, I think it's a really interesting question about um, accessibility in terms of, you know, do we, how, how do we create a world where people from all different walks of life can afford to take part in this augmented society. Uh, Tilly, did you want to, uh, to were you wanting yeah. to say something? Yeah, sure. Um, I just think 
there's a there's already a big gap between the rich and the poor for example and enhancing this technology now and having it only accessible to those who are rich and can afford to have it is just going to make that gap bigger and bigger and bigger and i feel like ultimately will cause a divide i want to talk about like what marco was saying originally that security needs to come first because if not then it'll only be a matter of time before like this can get into the wrong hands you know what i mean because not everybody's going to have pure intent so i feel like we need to make like um a global agreement universal decision i feel like firstly it should get to the people who need the most if we're talking about like accessibility i feel like the people who are missing limbs the people who are paralyzed should like get access to that first as well um we were talking about people with dementia and being able to help with their memory i feel like that needs to be treated first like priority before we start giving it just to other people who can afford it on the street you know what i mean otherwise i feel like it'll just cause a bigger problem that doesn't need to happen that's all i have to say <laughs> yeah and hannah's i mean i guess you're in the field of uh, you know commercializing um the idea of augmentation um at what point does it become something that, you know, is it a worry that it may be something that only the elite people with enough money can get the augmented benefit in life? And is that is that a fear that we need to be aware of? So the history of technology tells us that when a new technology comes into play, it's always in the beginning clumsy, expensive and doesn't work very well. So we saw that with smartphones, for example, that now are you, I mean, in the 1980s, when the first mobile phones were game, then they were just for the few, for the yuppies of Wall Street, right? And nowadays, most 10-year-olds, even in developing economies, uh, may have smartphones. Uh, I you think feel it's a natural... Applies. Exactly. That's how technology works, right? So uh, you can even take the example back to books. Books used to be super expensive in the Middle Ages. It was a gift for kings. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, ultimately... An Apple Watch is a pretty expensive and fragile device. Uh, a chip implant is a small, sturdy, and really cheap device. So uh, there's obviously a much bigger mass market for, for one of those. Uh, so yeah, I think that we'll be able to bring human augmentation really to the, um, to the masses in the coming decade. Uh, I, I have no doubt about that. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a great question here from another audience member. Um, is there an expiry date for the augmentations? Do they need to be changed or upgraded over time, both hardware and the software? Well, I guess for those of you with prosthetic limbs, that's not such a problem. But I mean, Hannes, if you're having something injected into your body, is, is, is your chip a forever chip? <clears throat> um, hardware wise it's you need to extract it obviously to upgrade it but since the devices we make don't have any battery or moving parts they can last for several decades and as i jokingly like to say i mean there's room for quite a few of them so you know just because one doesn't work doesn't mean you can't have a bunch of others it's kind of like apps on your phone really so are you going to end up like as, a, as an 80 year old man though, with incredibly heavy fingers with all the different <laughs> yeah, if that's their choice the that's totally what they should do <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely um great question though um if as next question from the audience member this is from arturo di corinto uh can we have more examples of cyborg vulnerabilities how can we prevent cyber attacks on prosthetic devices um, and what is kaspersky doing to protect bionic devices. So maybe we could come to either David or Marco for this. Uh, Marco. Marco. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, well, we, of course, we're, uh, we at Kaspersky, we're in this topic for quite some time. And of course, we're constantly developing uh, new technologies. One of the uh, main thing we're already uh, into for quite some time is uh, immunity. So uh, thinking about security first, which is exactly one of the core aspects of uh, such new technologies, and also getting deeper into uh, the hardware level with certain kind of technologies we're developing um, to really not just go into yeah security as an added value, but as an implemented core and essential functionality. And that's exactly the way we need to aim for. 
Absolutely. Uh, now, Arturo, you were looking for lots of more facts and figures. Obviously, we're limited on time today, but I'm sure that Kaspersky will be happy to follow up uh, with some of the data, especially from their research um, on that. Um, Isabel has a great question. Should we legislate who can make changes to their body and technology? Could there be superhumans in the future? That is, humans smarter or better eyesight than the average. Would this carry a risk? So, um, Victoria, what you know, do you think that there should be any limitations on the benefits to make you superhuman? I mean, I don't think so, but I feel like similarly with the development of technology, you know, it's a thing that is going to take time and there is no guarantee that it's not going to be something that isn't sort of fully democratized at the beginning, you know, um, some some examples include, for example, um, you know, the fact that going into space with less limbs is actually really advantageous because, you know, your your health is just maintained a lot better. You don't need to have all this extra extra sort of muscle decay and everything. So there's a lot of examples. I mean, I do feel like, you know, the reality of it is still really quite far away. But, um, you know, I, I do, I do, I personally like totally encourage it. And I think that it would be super awesome. All of the examples that were mentioned today, you know, from being able to, um, you know, have some kind of augmented reality layer to remember things better or whatever. I, I personally have dyslexia and I struggle with so many different things and being able to uh, have some kind of more integrated device that isn't my phone so I don't have to constantly be glued to my phone that's integrated into my body that will you know help me remember help me navigate help me do whatever you know sounds super awesome so um I do genuinely feel that the future of uh technology is to be smart technology that is much more integrated into you know into our body into our clothes so that we are much more hands-free and not just kind of staring at a screen I I genuinely believe that that is the way forward. Uh, Bertolt, from an academic perspective, do you mm. um, agree? Yes and no. Because on the one hand side, we can say it's everybody's individual personal choice what to do with their body and able-bodied people are free to enhance themselves, their wallet and technology permitting. On the other hand, if the majority of the population start enhancing themselves, Imagine a society where every 10-year-old gets an eye-enhancing laser surgery for their birthday. What that means is that the average eyesight would, over time, steadily increase. Theoretically, to a point where an eyesight that is today considered normal within the bounds of normalcy kind of moves away so far from the ever-increasing average eyesight that it may eventually become a disability. This is called a normative creep. And therefore, of course, collective action has effects on everyone, even on those who do not opt into this technology. I'm not saying we should forbid it, but this is something that we need to consider. Yeah, absolutely. One final question from Smart Life, Milos. Um, do you guys, and we'll do a show of hands for these, for this, I think. Do you guys believe augmentation will become the norm for all people in the future? Hands up if you do. Okay, so we got, <laughs> we got some mix there. Um, and, sh and when should we expect personal assistance and AI to be implemented into this technology? 30 seconds, anyone got any thoughts? I mean, I love the idea. Um, although having had a, a very rocky relationship with my A word, I'm not going to say her name because she's right there and she'll pipe up. I'm not so sure I, I, I currently trust the technology enough for them to do what you want them to do um, based on that command. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your questions. There's a couple that we didn't um, get answered, obviously, um, but don't worry, we will respond to those questions um, via email and um, you can always uh, keep in touch with us via the Kaspersky next email alias anyway. Um, and we can see there are lots of different viewpoints around the future direction of human augmentation. Uh, we are definitely going to watch this conversation more. Um, and um, Tilly, Victoria, Bertolt, Hannah, Marco and David, thank you so much for your time, your thoughts and your expertise today. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I could have got on for at least another hour. 
Um, if you want to request an interview or speak to any of the contributors one on one, then you can um, or you can also grab a copy of the next report um, that uh, that we've been talking about. If you haven't already got your hands on that, um, then you can request these through the Kapersky Next email alias or your PR contact who told you about this today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much to our guests. Thank you to you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and thank you for tuning in.